this lecture, we will be discussing newborn hyperbilly rubinemia. Let's talk about some of the jaundice basics. This is a quick review. Bilirubin is an end product of heme catabolism, so blood breakdown. It has a weak acid with a pH of 7.4, and bilirubin is removed from the human bloodstream via the liver and then excreted in stool and urine. Jaundice is a buildup of bilirubin in the blood. And this is usually due to an increased production and a delayed or slow excretion. Conjugated bilirubin versus unconjugated bilirubin is an important consideration. Conjugated bilirubin means that it's bound to glucuronic acid, it's water soluble, and therefore easily excreted into bile and eliminated via stool. Unconjugated bilirubin then is unbound, it's not water soluble and it's difficult to excrete. Let's talk about physiologic versus pathologic jaundice. Physiologic newborn jaundice, you see a gradual rise in the total bilirubin levels. It develops at about 48 hours to 120 hours of life, and it affects more than 80% of all newborns born in the US. The levels peak at three to five days of life, and they generally resolve one to two weeks following birth. In this case, it's benign, it's self-limiting, and it requires surveillance only, no treatment. Whereas pathologic newborn jaundice is defined by timing. So it's within the first 24 hours or after the first week and if present more than two weeks plus, or if the total serum billy level is greater than 18 or increases by five each day. We'll dive into that in more detail. Acute bilirubin encephalopathy, or ABE, equals reversible brain injury, whereas chronic bilirubin encephalopathy, or CBE, also known as kernicterus, is irreversible brain damage. What's physiologic versus breast milk jaundice? How do you know the difference? First of all, there's a later onset. So with physiologic jaundice, the bilirubin levels are improving at about week two. They're resolving. Whereas breast milk jaundice, those bilirubin levels are rising at week two, and they actually peak much later at week four. Breast milk jaundice, the etiology is still unclear. It's a question whether or not it's poor caloric intake, poor fluid intake, or is it due to increased neonatal weight loss. However, treatment in either case doesn't differ. Causes of hyperbilirubinemia. So newborns are at greater risk for several reasons. The first is high H and H levels, so hematocrit and hemoglo hemoglobin levels in utero. And this is needed to survive low oxygen uterine environment. Therefore, at birth, there is a rapid red blood cell lysis. Billy conjugation occurs in the liver, as we know, and newborns initially have immature liver function. There's also a reduction of intestinal flora in newborns and this reduces their ability to excrete bilirubin within the stool. And finally, there's a period of mild dehydration following birth, and this is especially true for exclusively breastfed infants, which is why it's recommended that they are nursed about 8 to 12 times a day. They're getting very little volume, so they need to be fed more frequently. Other causes of hyperbilly would be injuries at the time of birth, so the use of forceps, vacuum, any malposition in labor where there's been bruising within the maternal pelvis. An example would be cephalohematomas or other bruising on the scalp. There's maternal fetal blood typing incompatibilities, and from this there's ABO incompatibilities and RH compatibilities. And then finally, the G6PD deficiency. This is most common in African American, Mediterranean, and Asian descents. Screening and diagnosis. So hyperbilirubinemia in, for infants is measured in hours of life, and you'll see this on a nomogram that we'll look at together. We need to educate parents of signs and symptoms at the time of discharge home, and that's especially true for those without any nursing surveillance in the first full 24 hours of life. So that's home birth or freestanding birth center. Typically, babies are discharged at around eight hours postpartum in freestanding birth centers, and they do have RN home visits and or midwife, and or are returning to the birth center, but for those babes who will have a period, 
where it's just the parents assessing the newborn. This is especially important concept to review. So which newborns should be tested? We, we should be getting bilirubin levels on which babes? This is any newborn who appears jaundiced in the first 24 hours of life. Very true. Consider screening infants that are less than 38 weeks gestational age who are ex exclusively breastfed. The younger they are, the more immature their liver. So those who are in the preterm category for sure. But between that 37 to 38 week, we should definitely be screening those babes. There is a great table in one of your textbooks, Snell and Gardner, called the risk score, table 9.1, which is helpful. Signs and symptoms of jaundice, of course, yellow skin, yellow conjunctiva, and yellow mucous membranes. It generally progresses from the face to the trunk and then the extremities. And for that acute encephalopathy, you're going to see feeding and sleeping difficulties with lethargy. But by then, you're behind the ball. So if you have a babe that's jaundice and you notice that they're lethargic, you need to move very quickly. Now, this is an image of that nomogram that we referenced before. And you'll notice this is for newborns born after 35 weeks gestation. On the left, you'll see the TSB running vertically, the total serum bilirubin. And along the bottom, you have age based in hours, birth, 24 hours, 48, etc. And with the nomogram in the middle, you see the hashtag line for infants at low risk, the medium line for medium risk, and then the very bottom for high risk. So you'll chart the TSB once the lab uh, evaluates, and then write on this nomogram how many hours of life it was drawn at. Find out what your risk score is. If in an out-of-hospital setting, this is what you'd report to your pediatrician or your referring provider. So this is a jaundice mnemonic to help, and this is straight from the CDC. This is hyperbilinemia risk factors in full-term newborn, and this should alert the nurse midwife when they see these things, they should be drawing a TSB. The first J for jaundice. That's jaundice present within 24 hours. It is always pathologic if it's present within the first 24 hours. A is a sibling with jaundice as a newborn, so it runs in the family, and that could trigger you for an ABO incompatibility or RH incompatibility. U is unrecognized hemolysis, again, ABO or RH. N is non-optimal nursing or sucking, so they're lethargic. D is deficiency in G6PD, which increases their risk of jaundice. I is infection. C is cephalohematoma bruising. And E is East Asian or Mediterranean descent. So that's a quick mnemonic to help trigger your memory for who is most at risk and treatment. The mainstay for treatment is to promote successful breastfeeding. So increase breastfeeding frequency to establish milk supply. We want at least 8 to 12 feedings a day. That will hopefully increase the amount of milk supply and hopefully create letdown, or at least be sure that if it's there, we are promoting increased volume intake. Consider donor breast milk if supplementation is needed as opposed to formula. This can be very helpful and is often um, available in urban areas via hospitals or other banks. Consider pumping between nursing sessions to initiate an increased supply. And then a client education, we want at least six wet diapers a day, stool two to three times a day, and that color is transitioning from meconium to that CD breast milk and or formula poop. Of course, there's phototherapy. With phototherapy, you're exposing the newborn skin surface to lights. This helps break down the bilirubin and then is excreted in stool. There are hospital-based um, lights, and these are often called suitcases or billy blankets. Billy blankets are highly encouraged as they optimize breastfeeding and bonding. So with a billy blanket, also um, referred to as a billy bikini, it is a strip of lights within a fabric sort of envelope with tubes coming off one side. That fabric piece, which is a rectangle, so that longer portion is wrapped around the thorax of the babe, so ideally from axilla to groin, and then a blanket is wrapped around them. Parents can then hold. The newborn doesn't necessarily need to wear the lights as long as the blanket is uh, covering the lights and protecting the eyes. And these can be ordered oftentimes in out-of-hospital settings within the community. And again, these are called billy blankets. Labs are required to assess true bilirubin levels and efficacy of treatment. Um, visualization alone is inaccurate. So if you look 
and vis visualization is telling you, I'm worried about jaundice, that's perfectly appropriate, and then you draw a TSB. If the baby is then diagnosed with hyperbilirubinemia, you'll need to test either with transcutaneous or with blood levels. Um, you can't just look with visualization is what that statement means for the mainstay of treatment. And then if very severe ex exchange transfusions are needed, and so this is in severe cases, and of course this would be in a hospital setting and would probably be a near-death situation. So what does follow-up look like? Uh, follow-up, you're going to consult and or transfer care to a pediatrician. There are different practice protocols. So ensure that you know what that looks like if you were to take a call in the middle of the night and or get labs late at night. What are you going to do with these newborns? Advocate for families that are desiring home care when possible. If they can get a billy blanket or a billy suitcase from their insurance provider and sent home. This is an image of a babe wearing a billy blanket. So you can see that glow underneath. And they are obviously in a home setting there being treated and they have home visits from nurses who are visiting just to ensure that those levels are going down, trending downward. We also need client education regarding hydration. So we're looking at diapers, infant affect. So are they acting quote unquote normally, right? They cry, but they're easy to soothe. They eat, they sleep, they're kind of doing all of their normal behaviors as opposed to lethargic and or poor tone. And then visualization of physiologic jaundice. So certainly we're not basing our treatments based on visualization, but you want parents to be aware of the difference between sclera, jaundice, head jaundice, and all the way down to the belly button, right? So if we see jaundice that low, we're going to be worried parents should know about that. We also want to promote bonding during phototherapy whenever we can. So we don't want to stop these babes from being at breast, especially because we know this is how we increase the ability to excrete bilirubin via the stool in the urine. And then, of course, continuity and breastfeeding support in general, just to make sure that post this um, you know, intervention and this blip or challenge in this immediate postpartum period, that breastfeeding is going well and both mom and babe can continue moving forward with that. If you have any questions, post them in the general discussion forum. I hope this was helpful in understanding neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. Mm -hmm.